All right. I want to switch then to evolutionary psychology. Now, just, just to be clear, again, not a, my field. I'm not an expert. Don't know much about this. But I, know en- but I know enough to ask the right kind of questions. And what I want to do is ask some questions. Because I know a lot of you, for example, are fans of uh, Jordan Peterson and fans of other people out there who, are, who use evolutionary psychology all the time. I see it on YouTube videos. I see it on Facebook. I see it on Twitter. I see it everywhere. Everybody just assumes evolutionary psychology is true. I, I watched a video of Steven Pinker debating uh, this woman, and I forget the woman's name, but about the difference between, between men and women. And again, using kind of the evolutionary psychology, or what I take to be the evolutionary psychology methodology to do that. And, uh, you know, and I have a lot of questions. So I'm mostly going to be asking questions. I mostly want to suggest to you this idea. That this is another one of those fields that is young, new, that we know very little about. And when people come out and say definitive things, oh, men behave this way because they evolved in this way. Uh, I don't know. Uh, men tend to want to have many sexual partners because they're promiscuous, because they generate lots of sperm and they need to distribute that sperm because what's important evolutionarily is having children, right? And, and that drives men to have the inclination to have affairs and to sleep with many women, right? Right? <laughs> I mean, I've heard this. This is, not, this is not unusual. This is a common claim. Women, on the other hand, can only, uh, can only have, uh, you know, one baby at a time. They, uh, they, uh, they are weaker, therefore they need to latch on to the one man uh, that impregnates them. They need to keep him around, so they, they, they are much more likely to be monogamous. Women also attracted to wealthy guys because those, this is all stuff that comes out of evolutionary psychology. Some of it's pop evolutionary psychology, some of it's real evolutionary psychology, whatever that means. Now, what is evolutionary psychology? Now, this is a definition, this is from the Science Daily, uh, but, they, but I'm sure there are others. Uh, evolutionary psychology is a theoretical approach to psychology that attempts, so first of all, it's in the field of psychology, that attempts to explain useful mental and psychological traits, useful mental and psychological traits, such as memory, perception, or language, as adaptations, as the functional products of natural selection. So the idea is natural selection has selected certain mental and psychological traits, all right? So I want to ask a simple question. I don't expect, a, I don't expect uh, an answer, but uh, these are the kind of questions I would ask. Let me, uh, Do we understand in psychology, in psychology, that, that's the field that, that does evolutionary psychology. Do we have a good understanding in psychology on what are, Right? What are traits, capabilities, and behaviors? Right? What are they? Does psychology have a good understanding of what perception is? Or do you think you would come to different conclusions about perception if you held different philosophical views within evolutionary psychology? Do the psychologists have good understanding of emotions and where they come from and the relationship between emotions and ideas and thoughts. Do they understand what thoughts are and, you know, the basis for thought? Do they understand the idea of rationality and what rationality is? Do they value reason? Do they believe in free will? And what is the role of free will vis-a-vis whatever psychological traits we might have received through evolution? Through, through natural selection. So these are the kind of questions I would ask. And I don't think from everything I've read and from all the videos I've watched that there is what I see 
in, in, even in the best thinkers, even in the, talk, call it the Jordan Petersons of the world, and, and the Stephen Pinkers of the world, and the woman he debated, is almost no mention of free will, no mention of human reason, no mention of rationality, no mention of, of, of what they mean by traits, what is the border of trait? Do they think, for example, uh, you know, where does, where does uh, and I, you can over, even go deeper, what is psychology actually studying? Is psychology a science yet? How much knowledge do we have in psychology? Notice that the evolutionary psychologists often ignore cognitive psychology, which from the little I understand is, is probably most uh, uh, interested in thinking and in ideas and in concepts and the impact that ideas and concepts have on emotions. Right. So, you know, so, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Again, this is not my field. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend to have answers, but I would just say, beware, beware of, of these definitive answers that they come across. Men are different than women because here's the list. Now I am convinced unequivocally without any question that men are different than women and that there is a biological basis for that. I'm convinced of that, a biological basis and a psychological basis. The men are different than women. How, in what ways in particular? Again, above my pay grade. But the very fact that men and women are biologically so different is going to make them different in other, in the way they relate to reality. The very fact that men and women uh, have, 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 uh, have, you know, have different biological experiences. Men don't have a menstrual cycle. I think a menstrual cycle has an impact on a woman. Now, what impact? I don't know. But it's an experience a man will never have. You know, the experience of thinking men and women have the same, right? The experience of, uh, I don't know, having a nail into it, the physical experience of, of, of having to walk, of having to think of it. All of those experiences are similar are the same between men and women, and therefore I don't think there's any cognitive difference between men and women in that sense. But there are differences, and how they manifest themselves in emotion or in behavior, or you know, is interesting. It's interesting in values and values they seek is interesting. The fact that the male penetrates the female is significant. It's not irrelevant. It can't be irrelevant psychologically. The fact that for the most part, men rape women, women don't rape men, that is significant. So all of that plays into the differences between men and women. And all of that should, should be studied. Now, there is a legitimate question, and that is what traits and I don't even know exactly what traits are, but what traits are genetic? So I can tell you that my two sons were completely different from minute one. In what way were they different? Um, in how, how aware they were of their surroundings, how much sleep how much they slept, um, you know, whether the, the eye movement, uh, the level in which they engaged with the environment around them, the, the amount of crying. So all these things. Now, do we understand those differences? Those are pretty simple. Right. So Those are pretty simple, and, and I don't think we have a full understanding on them. So, I, look, I'm not saying evolutionary psychology is determinism, is deterministic necessarily, although I think many evolutionary psychologists are determinists. But even to ask the questions of what are traits, what are inherited traits, what are learned habits, maybe traits are by definition inherited, what are habits? What, a tr what influence do traits have 
on our cognitive functioning? What influences do our traits have on our emotions, on our habits, on you know, our psychology, on our capabilities, and ultimately on our behavior? I think that evolutionary psychology is way too uh, dependent on statistics, way too dependent on storytelling, that is uh, making up story, evolutionary stories that explain what they want to explain. They've got a theory, they've got a, and then they go back and they find a story in evolution to explain it. Eh, you know, it's, it's very, very questionable as a science. And, and, you know, Ayn Rand said that in her lifetime, she said psychology was in its infancy. It was just beginning as a science. They were just starting to think about what were the relevant questions. And I think to some extent that is true. I think to some extent that is true. And if that's true, if psychology is still very early, then evolutionary psychology is even earlier. And evolutionary psychology won't be a, a, a fully fledged science until it has those psychological foundations built, until we understand more of what we are talking about. What are the core scientific questions we have to ask? What is psychology? So my suspicion is that much of what you hear in evolutionary psychology is just is 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 just not true. It's 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 statistics and correlations and and uh, and correlate. And I saw this with Stephen Pinker's presentation. Correlations, a, a correlation is not causality, and they try to attribute causality and they and they they come up with biological evolutionary stories to to make the causal attribution. But look. I know a little bit about evolution and I, you know, and I've studied some biology and, and I think most people, let me rephrase that. I think most intelligent people, I think most intelligent, educated people don't really understand biology. Uh, sorry, don't really understand evolution. Evolution is not trivial. What natural selection is, is not trivial. So beware of becoming a amateur psychologist. Beware becoming an amateur evolutionary psychologist because I think the professionals are on shaky ground. I think the amateurs don't know what they're talking about. And I see too many out there, way too many amateur evolutionary psychologists. So I'm not saying it's an illegitimate field. I'm just saying it's young, it's new. There's a lot of questions to ask and without the right philosophical framework, it's very difficult to ask the right questions. And since they don't have the right philosophical framework, they're not asking the right questions, right? Um, what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.